So I could talk uh, very briefly about uh, one approach to quantum computing, uh, which is one that we're, we're taking here in Cambridge. Um, there are many other approaches, um, uh, but I'd like to perhaps also get some, some context. So it actually is a large traditional electronics company, an electrical company, um, and the model for research in Japan is uh, of having a large number of uh, very traditional research laboratories for, for corporate research. So approximately 6,000 research scientists were working in corporate labs in Japan. Uh, so from, from one point of view, it seems like a very uh, traditional uh, old-fashioned sort of company. But actually, if you look at detail, there's actually is a, um, a group of about 1,000 different companies. The average company size is about 400 people. And um, in actual fact, then it's actually expanding, becoming more of a global company, uh, largely in the 1980s. It was decided that uh, instead of having this uh, large corporate laboratory model uh, in the overseas operations, to have a rather more distributed network of small focused laboratories. Um, and in fact, this, this, is, this is true um, for intelligence operations worldwide and uh, outside Japan. And what that's meant is that within Europe we have a number of uh, small laboratories uh, based typically where there is local expertise in an area that's of particular business interest to, uh, to one part of the country. And in Cambridge that means that uh, the activity in Cambridge is mostly based around work on device physics uh, because of the local expertise here. But we are strongly uh, incorporated in the country's global uh, research with very strong links to uh, the other research activities, business activities in Japan and uh, America particularly. So in Cambridge, uh, we have a slightly unusual setup. Um, we're based at the Cambridge Laboratory. Uh, we share a building uh, with the Macrotronics Research Centre, which is one of the uh, research groups within the Cambridge. Uh, and we pull resources and share facilities. The way that we set it up uh, 17 years ago was that most of the uh, facilities on the university side uh, are based around that fabrication, particularly electron beam lithography. And most of the facilities on the Hitachi side are based around advanced measurement, both electrical and optical. But in order to do any of the uh, nano device work that we do, we need both sets of facilities together. And, and everybody working in the building has equal uh, free access to all of the facilities within the building. So currently we've got uh, a, a number of people, about 25 people working on quantum information and a similar number of people working on nanoscotronics and a smaller number working on organic devices. So I'm going to talk about the, the quantum information side of things. But just to put that in some context, um, the, the remit of our laboratory, say maybe 20 years ago, was to approach electronic devices from a quantum mechanical point of view. And to, to illustrate that, uh, I've borrowed this set of uh, diagrams from this Haslock and Glasgow. What he's done is taken a schematic picture of a field pack transistor, so source and drain contact, a silicon channel, uh, thin in yellow, uh, gate dielectric, and the gate product. Then superimpose it upon that for a 25 nanometer gate current a scaled atomic picture. So the, uh, the light gray dots are supposed to be silicon atoms, the colored dots are supposed to be dirt atoms. And you can start to see some of the problems that are hitting uh, conventional technology, uh, silicon technology even now. So the, uh, the dirt atoms you can count them in a 25 nanometer gate length device. To put that in context, uh, the, the gate length that you'll get in a a uh, microprocessor we buy today is approximately 40 nanometers. But the graphic dimension is larger, but the real gate length after fabrication is about 40 nanometers. The gate oxide is starting to get just a few atoms thick, and that has implications for things like tunneling through, through, through the gate out. If we scale that further, down to say a 4 or 5 nanometer gate length uh, device, then the same, if everything scales, if certain devices everything has scaled largely, then uh, the gate dielectric almost disappears. You might have one or two dopant atoms in the channel 
So the distribution of open data becomes a, a, an issue. If you want to make these things reliable, you want to make uh, 10, to 10, 10 to 11 uh, transistors per chip for a future microprocessor. And the, the, the whole challenge is to secure atoms and costs. So what you're starting to get is it's, it's a, a structure which is inherently quantum mechanical. In order, even though the, uh, the electron transport current room temperature might be massive, in order to understand the detail of that electron transport, you need to understand the quantum mechanics of the system. So our remit originally was to look at the uh, electronic devices, small electronic devices, from the point of view of quantum mechanics. And that has largely evolved into our activities today in terms of quantum devices. And the other thing is that although these are difficult devices to make, uh, they are possible to make. It's quite possible to make devices of this size reproducibly in large enough numbers with the sort of yields necessary for making my own sort of devices. You can make devices of this size that have acceptable transistor characteristics. They're not very good transistors, but they're acceptable transistors. So I think the, 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 the history of sort of uh, large scale sort of operation uh, uh, is continuing, and I think it will continue for, certainly for, for my career. And the message there is that I think probably most people uh, working at high level know this, but it's not good enough to have a, a structure that's slightly better than a silicon transistor uh, if you want to make a replacement for uh, a, a conventional large volume electron circuit. Uh, to be useful, and, and we've seen many aspects of this today. Uh, new, new types of device must have new functionality, really, or there must be something incredibly better than sort of so the standard commercial sort of And of course, the reason I'm here is that uh, this is a new function. And to put that in the context of computing, um, I think there are three generations of electronic computing. Um, uh, in the 1940s, Turing, Bob Ryan, and others uh, realized that it was possible to Imagine a universal computing device, a, a, a machine that you could use to perform arbitrary calculations with, with appropriate programming. We know that we can make that computers. Then, in the 60s and 70s, this is probably most forcibly put forward by Rolf Landauer at uh, IBM, it was realized that if you, wanted to, if you want to manipulate information, then you can't consider information as an abstract quantity. In order to perform information processing, that every bit of information has to be embodied in a physical entity. And once you embody the information in a physical entity, then you have all of the issues such as the laws of thermodynamics to deal with if you want to design a real electronic instrument. And that manifests itself nowadays, particularly in the heat dissipation within a building chip. It is nowadays very, very difficult to use most laptops on your lap from any sort of length of time because they just get too hot. Um, but then, very shortly after that in the mid-1980s, first David Deutsch and then and rapidly other people uh, said that if information has to be embodied in a physical entity, then as you scale the structures down, at some point that entity becomes quantum mechanical. And we know that strange things happen in quantum mechanics. Can we use those strange things that happen to perform new forms of information processing? And of course, the, the answer is yes. We can exploit that quantum openness. And broadly speaking, this, this has been subdivided into uh, two areas uh, today in terms of the technological applications. Uh, and there's actually a, 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 an intermediate area which, which is starting to link the two. We'll work, we'll work on that. Once we come for quantum cryptography, it's not real cryptography, but it's a means of transmitting information that is retrospectively absolutely secure. Essentially, you use the principles of quantum measurements, that if you put, for example, your bit of information on one photon, and you can use protocols of passing that photon from one side to another, that you, you, you can tell whether it's been interfered with on the way, tell whether it's been measured on, on the way. And this can be used this, this Lots of demonstration systems in development to do this. Essentially, uh, there, there, there are many technological uh, difficulties in doing this, but this is a relatively well established technology. We're working at that and we're talk about that today. Um, the other aspect is quantum computation. And this uses uh, 
the, the massive potential and information content of a, of a complex quantum system to perform certain types of computational tasks. It's been shown uh, both experimentally and theoretically uh, that if you had certain arrangements of quantum computer, you can solve, solve certain problems that are literally impossible in a finite time with all of the potential computers in the world put together. Um, I, I want to emphasize that because I think some people imagine that quantum computers is a faster computer. It's not a faster computer. Um, it, it, it's a completely different way of processing information. And that means it's particularly suited for certain tasks. And at the moment, there are only one or two of those tasks, only one or two algorithms that have been developed. Uh, but I think most people working in the field feel that because these one or two algorithms have shown the immense potential power of, of, of such a computer, then it must be possible to develop other algorithms to do other tasks. But this is a lot of really complex to, 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 to concentrate on uh, this fact and where the breakpoint is. Now this is from the point of view of some of the devices I'll show you in a couple of minutes. Uh, these are rather large circuits. If you think of the uh, in, in, in a microprocessor, there might be 10 to 9, 10 to 10 uh, devices per, per chip. Then these are rather large and small circuits. So if we could make a perfect quantum computer with a hundred what are called qubits. So the qubit is the quantum analogy to the classical bit. The classical bit is one or zero. A qubit quantum bit can take any combination of one or zero, which is essentially an infinite number of possibilities of state. But when you measure it, it returns just, just, just one state. If you can make a perfect quantum computer with perfect qubits, then we would need just a hundred qubits. And the reason for that is the information content rises exponentially with the, uh, the number of qubits. It's the old chessboard problem. Now we know that the, the no system that we make artificially can we make perfect things. There's always some uh, disorder, some uh, errors in, in the system. But there are just as a, in, in classical information processing, we don't rely on the information processing being perfect. The error correction and error, error testing uh, algorithms or architectures. And it's been shown that exactly the same way in positive information, you can use error correction algorithms or error correction architectures, which at the expense of the number of units uh, maintain the coherence of the system uh, long enough to do quantum computation. And if, if, if you include that, that, that error correction, then the breakpoint is still remarkably small. Somewhere around 10 to 4, around a 10,000 cubic computer, could start to do some tasks that are impossible with a classical computer. So that, 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 that's very interesting from the point of view of, of, of design. It's still a vast technological problem. And um, for, for uh, anybody interested in the field, I strongly recommend cubic.org, which is a website um, jointly run. Not in Cambridge. It has a, a wealth of information from a very, very simple introduction to a very technical and other debate. So, what, what we need to make a, a, a good qubit to make a good quantum computer? We need to find, we, we need to make the qubits. Okay, actually, that turns out to be rather trivial. There are lots of potential candidates for the, the qubits. We need to prepare them. We have lots of techniques for manipulating and electronic systems. Uh, the difficult bit is that allowing them to evolve without interactions. In this field, decoherency means an interaction you can't follow, some sort of noise in the system. Um, there needs to be interactions between them, and then we need to measure them. And that's the other difficult bit. So it, it's this evolving quietly without any other interference, and being able to measure the system at the end and real difficulties in turning this into a technology. Essentially, uh, what we do best uh, in uh, our lab, I think, is turn physics experiments into proof of principle devices. I wouldn't even say that they're prototype devices. They're proofs of principle of potential device operation. This is done within the context of the wider uh, research activity within the company. As what we made just about a year ago now, I want to make a structure that looks like this. Uh, put this Okay, this is an electron micrograph 
of a small circuit structure. This is what we call a gearbox. Um, these are electrical gates which come in for uh, slow and fast manipulation. And then this is uh, what's called an electrometer, which is used for reading out information. So we have all of the elements uh, that we need for making the qubit, this single qubit. This is like the, the equivalent of the transistor in conventional electronics. And what we showed about a year ago was that if we make structures like this, uh, we get very nice results. We, 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 see, we see results which are promising for using this technology as, 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 as the basis for a, a quantum computer. Still just, just the one unit, okay? just the one transistor equivalent. And if we think that we know uh, why it's better, so it's essentially for many of the same reasons that silicon is the best material, it's a good material for large scale or conventional electronics. Uh, but the, the nice thing about this is that we can use relatively straightforward silicon question techniques. And they're not frankly level uh, straightforward, but they're, they're relatively straightforward. And, and we can scale it up. One of the issues within quantum computing is. Okay, we've got a single qubit. Many people have shown individual qubits. But can we make a circuit? Can we make, put 10,000 of them together to make that great point circuit? So, the moment we're doing is addressing some of those points. So, this is the next stage. This is again a natural micrograph of real structure. And this is the first attempt to start to put these together. And at the moment, it takes a lot of analysis to, to show that these are behaving in the cost mechanical way that we need. Uh, for the future. But this is the next building block. So in quantum computing, very much uh, as in classical computing, uh, the building block element is the transistor, but the architectural building block is the Boolean gate, which is usually made of several transistors together. And by putting those, those, those gates together architecturally, you make a computer. And the same is true in quantum computing. You need a certain set of what are called quantum gates. Uh, to be able to build a, a quantum computer. And once you've shown that your physical entity obeys the rules of that quantum gate, then you can start to build an architecture in, in, a, in a one level of abstraction above the, the physical entity. And so this is the next step. We're, we're working on this this is This is a two qubit gate. And this is one of the building block elements. The other issue is, is that you need to control the system. In fact, we've been working strongly with um, uh, people in Oxford University, particularly Simon Benjamin, who's developed a lot of architectures for what's called global addressing. So, in global addressing, um, it's a very neat system. So, if you want to talk to one of these qubits, you can apply a certain pulse sequence to the entire uh, body of qubits, and that will have a different action depending on the local state of the system. So, uh, what Simon shows is that for both classical and quantum computing, for example, if you have a, 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 a linear array of A type, B type qubits, you apply the same pulse point if, if, if say, to, to an A type qubit. If that's, if it's not, these neighbors are, say, 0, 1, or 1, 0, or 0, 0, in each of these three different conditions, the pulse will have a different effect. And it's been shown that you can use this effect to perform all of the tasks necessary for quantum classical computation in this type of, of array. And you, you can scale it up to two dimensions as well. But then just to finish, um, a few years ago we realized that if we're embarking on, on this creation of a new uh, information processing technology, then what would happen if five, ten years down the line we'd be working on these, these pupils, we started to make complex structures. Um, and then we need it to manipulate these, these, these complex circuits, low temperatures. I should say, because a quantum computer can perform, potentially perform tasks that are impossible by classical means, then it makes sense for at least the first quantum computers, if we need to go to very low temperatures, to, to, to do that. Now, many people who are familiar with the history of classical computing will know that many people uh, over the years, pretty much since computers started being built, Proposed cooling computers uh, to make them faster. And you can certainly do that. But at every stage, it's been cheaper to buy two or four or a hundred computers rather than cool one down to, to, to low temperature. For quantum computing, because there is this possibility of performing tasks that are impossible 
by classical means. Then, even though it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a trouble and it's a complication, it makes sense to, to make the first ones go to temperatures. So we realize that if we're going to make these, these devices, then um, if we just went, went ahead and, and made them, then we come to a point where we had structures which are too complex to measure given our standard low temperature measurement equipment. So a few years ago we started a basic technology program and here in our core a collaboration here in Cambridge between the Cambridge University and the Tachy. Uh, we got together with Oxford University, Oxford Instruments who make the low, many of the low temperature uh, electronic systems that, that, that we use. And here crucially at the Earth Labs, the Central Laboratories and Research Council. And here what we've developed is a platform for a future quantum computer. We hope to have a, this project is just finishing, and we hope to have an announcement of this uh, early next year. But essentially what we have is a functioning, rather complex platform uh, uh, to run a quantum computer. What we have is the, the custom uh, electronics that we, we make locally in Cambridge uh, for the quantum computer plus and so many electronics around it. We can build out the temperatures. Uh, but then, around that, if you like, a shield working at 4.2 Kelvin of custom ASICs, custom application specific integrated circuits designed at the Rutherford Labs, which act as a buffer interface uh, between room temperature, which is a very noisy environment, and a very quiet, low temperature world of the quantum computer. And uh, the idea is, is that using this structure, which is now in the second generation of the uh, architectures and second generation testing, uh, we can have a platform which will be able to run at least the first embryonic quantum computers. We're hoping that it will be the silicon devices that I've just talked about, but the design of the platform is such that it will run a, a, quite a wide range of, of potential quantum computers. So, I'd like to finish there. I'd like to re emphasize the fact that um, what I've shown today is just one approach, it is one, one of our approaches. Uh, which, is, which are some of many approaches to, to, to making quantum computers. And the, the technological problems are going to be very tough, but I think that there are technological problems which can be solved. Thanks.
you see to be the fundamental problems that we as a local industrial community can provide to you in to help you solve the problems? Okay, so um, the first thing, which is why we're working with lots of instruments, uh, is as I say, that the uh, getting a lot of complex operation at low temperatures. But ultimately, we might hope that we can run uh, these systems at the best of the high temperatures, uh, as we've shown, in fact, with single electric devices. Um, but in the first instance, um, I imagine that we will have to work with low temperatures. And so, we'll need, rather, although the, the, what we have here with these custom ASIC work for the two company is the first fortune attempt to do that. But ultimately, if we need a circuit, that has maybe 10,000, 100,000, a million or more uh, qubits in it, then we need some very, very sophisticated electronics around that uh, in order to be able to control it, to get the information in, get the information out. And I, I, I'd say that, that making that electronic infrastructure at both uh, the intermediate temperatures and room temperature would, would be the first stage in um, the next generation of the Beyond that, then I, I think that uh, as we get to um, more and more temperatures, then you can imagine lots of lots of information. In, in the first instance, we really see this as the sort of equivalent of a, a, a supercomputer 